My name is Professor Dolores Umbridge, and I will have order. Open your books to chapter 18 of Whale Song. <laughs> I'm going to read normal, though. After my father's incarceration, I prepared to move to my grandparents' house on the mainland. Nona Sophia and I packed away all of my parents' belongings. I wrapped my mother's jewelry box with my father's favorite shirt and stuffed it deep into a box filled with clothing and various knickknacks. We loaded everything, including my things, into a moving van, and I said a tearful goodbye uh, to my beautiful room with the view of the ocean. Then I walked for the last time on the beach. I love you, Mom, I sobbed, tracing the words into the sand with a stick. I circled them with a heart. I whispered farewell to the sandy beach and, and wooden raft, then plodded back to the house that was no longer my home. It was time to say goodbye to Goldie and the Dixon family. They waited in the driveway, their faces painfully sad. Don't forget me, Sarah, Goldie said, trying not to cry. She handed me a package. Open it in the car. It's from all of us. Nana brushed my bangs from my eyes. Some day your memories will bring you home, hi, Nayu. Keep your eyes open for Wolf, and don't forget the lesson that Seagull learned. Sometimes holding on to things only brought suffering. As we pulled away from 231 Bayview Lane, I pressed my face against the window. Goldie turned away, sobbing, while her family waved. Nana watched us leave, her long black hair with its unusual white streak blowing in the breeze. I saw her reach a hand upward and pluck something from the sky. She held it high above her head and waved it slowly. I recognized the object, an eagle's feather. A moment later, a minute later, we rounded a curve and they were gone. With a sniffle, I opened the package that Goldie had given me. I cried out softly at the apparition of a silver wolf. The ornament was about six inches long and shaped from pearlized ceramic. I stared at it in dismay. The wolf strained its head as it voicelessly howled at me. Follow me. My grandparents lived in a tiny, crowded two-bedroom condominium in North Vancouver. It was awkward to watch them as they made room for me. Their spare bedroom contained a twin bed and Nona Sophia's sewing machine, yet within a month they had decorated it in a way that was much more suited to a girl my age. The high school was a few blocks away, and although it was swarming with teenagers, I made very few friends. Rumors preceded me, and I was ostracized by my fellow classmates. That didn't matter to me. I had already begun to disconnect myself from life. I kept in touch with Annie and Goldie during the first two months, but because they reminded me of melancholy times, I stopped writing and calling. I convinced myself that I was being unselfish by letting their friendship slip away, that they needed to move on without me. Nana frequently stayed with us, hoping to cheer me up with her Indian legends, but I became cynical and short-tempered, and eventually she stopped visiting. I spent the first year surrounding myself with negative emotions, distrusting anyone who tried to get close to me. I packed away everything that reminded me of my mother and my past life in Bamfield, including the wolf ornament that the Dixons had given me. Every night, I fervently prayed that my amnesia would take away everything, every rotten memory. My grandparents constantly reminisced about my life in Bamfield. I think they believed it would help to soften me. Nona Rocco would remind me of the trips on the, on the research schooner with my dad, and Nona Sophia would smile and ask me questions. I don't remember, I'd always reply. I figured if I answered that way often enough, they'd get the hint and leave me alone. I also thought that the more I said those three words, the more real they would become. My grandparents grew concerned and afraid, so they sent me to counselors, psychologists, and even to church. But nothing helped. I didn't want to forgive my mother for dying, and I didn't want to forgive my father for killing her. I internalized my emotions and became increasingly desperate, depressed, especially after my first visit to Matsky Institute to see my father. That day I was filled with apprehension. I'd overheard horror stories from the boys in my class about prison riots and the sexual abuse that inmates were often subjected to. When I entered through the prison gates, I heard them slam and lock with finality. Oh God, I moaned, terrified of being trapped inside. After we talked, walked through a metal detector, my grandmother's purse was searched and we were told to empty our pockets. Then we were led to the visitor's area. I sat down at a table while my grandparents chatted a few feet away with a guard. The visitor's area was filled with other relatives waiting for their loved ones. When a rough-looking inmate filed past me, I stared at him, terrified. The short, obese black man eyed me indecently and whispered a crude comment as he passed by. I cringed and looked at the wall. Hurry up, Dad. And then I saw him. Relieved, I jumped to my feet. Dad! My voice caught in the back of my throat. My father's closely cropped hair was more gray than blonde. 
His face was gaunt and bruised, and there were dark, puffy circles under his eyes. Although he wore the standard prison uniform, it was obvious that he'd lost weight. "'Hey, Sarah,' he said, his voice hoarse. He hugged me quickly, then he flipped a self-conscious look at the prison guard. "'How's school?' Good, I said, not knowing what else to say. Are the teachers nice? I shrugged. I guess. We talked about school, my grandparents, anything except my mother, her death, or the fact that my father was in prison for murder. I wanted to ask him what prison was like, but I didn't have the nerve. I don't think I could have handled the truth. After a few minutes, Nona Rocco and Nona Sophia joined us. They talked about inconsequential things. I stared at the floor, lost in my thoughts, and didn't notice when the guard signaled to my father that it was time for him to leave. I felt relieved, thankful that the visit was over. I hated the prison. I hated the bars. My father wrapped his arms around me, leaned close to my ear. Do you remember anything yet? I shook my head. When I stepped outside the prison walls, I groaned with relief and breathed in fresh air. I told myself that I'd never go back, no matter what. But my father begged me to see him, and I did. After the second visit, I hid in my bedroom, pulled out my art book and art books, and furiously began my own form of therapy. I drew... I produced pictures of horrible things, demons sent to destroy me, creatures from the sea, anything to vent my anger. Upon seeing my works of art, the psychologist told my grandparents that visiting my father had done me more harm than good. The visit stopped. In November of 1980, I implored my grandparents to bring me back to Matsky Institute. I missed my father. For some reason, Nonoroko wouldn't look me in the eye. He tried to convince me that visiting hours had been cut back that it wasn't the right time or that my father couldn't have visitors that day. Finally, in February 81, I visited my father for the third time. Some of the inmates who walked past me were even seedier than the last time I'd been there. And some looked like normal, law-abiding men, the kind you'd meet anywhere. There was, however, a definite undercurrent running through the prison. I felt it in the unusual restlessness among the prisoners. Even my father appeared agitated. Is everything okay? I asked stiffly. You need anything? He shook his head. No, I'm good. We, we stumbled through an awkward game of catch-up. Neither of us had anything important to say. We'd both shut down. I couldn't wait for the visit to be over, and I glanced at my watch uneasily. When our time was up, I rushed outside. I stood in the rain, lifted my face, and cleansed my soul. In early June, I flicked on the television during a break from studying and caught a news report that made my heart stop. Matsky Institute was on fire. I ran into the kitchen. Nona! What is it? My grandmother cried out alarmed. What's wrong, Karina? We watched in horror as reporters commented on a prison riot while camera footage showed flames engulfing several of the prison buildings. Over 300 inmates have seized control of Matsky Institute, a reporter said. Eight staff members are fighting for their lives on the roof of one of the burning buildings. Rescue teams are now on their way. The camera panned over to the eight trapped men. They waved frantically at a helicopter hovering above them. The men were airlifted from the building minutes before it collapsed. What about Dad? I asked fearfully. My grandmother rushed to the phone. I heard her speaking to my grandfather in Italian. I couldn't understand a word, but the sound of someone sobbing translates in any language. Nono will call us back, she reassured me when she hung up the phone. We sat at the kitchen table, waiting, daring the phone to ring. Half an hour later, Nono Roko called. My, grand my grandmother murmured a few words before passing me the phone. Sarah, your papa is fine, my grandfather said. His voice sounded tinny through the phone receiver. Did he get hurt? I asked anxiously. He's a little bruised and sore. He got trampled in the riot, but he's okay. I sniffled. Can I see him? The line was muffled. I'm sorry, Karina, Nona Roko said a minute later. They have to fix the prison before visitors can come back. My grandmother hugged me in after I hung up. Don't you worry. You'll see your papa soon. Once more, I threw myself into my art. I painted and designed posters for imaginary plays. Anything to help me escape from the reality that was my life. When kids at school asked about my parents, I lied. I told them that my mother was a famous artist who toured the world and my father traveled with her. No one really believed me. I wrote my father every day, sometimes more than five pages detailing my day. But everything I told him was a lie, except that I wanted him to come home. Every day after school, I waited by the phone, praying that he'd call me. The phone calls became less frequent. I did what I could to help my grandparents, but mostly I just stayed out of their way. I knew that they loved me, but I often wondered whether I was a burden to them. At times, their modest home felt claustrophobic, and I'd escape outside. I wandered the streets, leaving Nona Sophia and Nona Rocco to worry about me. Three years after I moved in with my grandparents, my father called me. 
Usually he'd speak to Nonoroko, so I knew immediately that something was up. Sarah, he said, can you come visit me tomorrow? I was relieved that I was finally going to see him, since all of my requests had been denied for one reason or another. In the back of my mind, I sensed that he had something urgent and important to tell me. When I saw him, he looked uncomfortable and nervous. I don't want you to come here anymore, he said softly, or asked to come here anymore. I gaped at him, shocked. But Dad, you're all I have. I'll still write and call you occasionally. You need to move forward with your life. I shook my head. How can I move forward without you? Your, grandfather, your grandmother told me that you refused to go out with your friends, that you no longer call Goldie or even Amber Lynn. She said that all you do is write to me, draw horrible pictures, and wait by the phone for me to call. What business is it of hers? I snapped. She's concerned about you, Sarah. So am I. Yeah, right, I muttered. He stretched one hand across the table. You can't lose yourself in school and work. There's more to life than that. It's not you. I scowled at him and yanked my hand away. How do you know who I am? You're in here. I'm out there trying to... I know, Sarah. You're trying to live without a mother and a father. I'm so sorry for that. Nobody expected that I'd end up here. I just want you to be happy, to find someone you can love. Love, I said, mocking him, like you loved mom or me. You loved her so much you killed her. He flinched as if I had slapped him. All the anger and resentment I had toward him boiled over. Unleashing a tirade of angry words, I poured out everything I had always been afraid to say. You loved me so much that you left me alone, with everyone knowing that my father is a murderer. Do you think I want or need that in my life? That's fine, Dad. I'll leave. I know when I'm not wanted. His face drained of all color. But Sarah, what? My eyes blazed with, blazed with fury. At least I had Nona Rocco and Nona Sophia. Yes, they've been wonderful. Everything I could have hoped for. But it's not the same. I flew out of the chair and stomped toward the door. I can't understand what you did, I said, refusing to look at him. Your lawyer might want to call it a suicide, but everyone else calls it murder. I'll never forgive you for killing Mom. She might have begged you to do it, but you should have said no. I glared at him. Don't worry, Dad. I won't be back. Ever. Visiting hour was over. I lived in my grandparents' condo until shortly after my 18th birthday. Nona Rocco had been hinting that they wanted to return to Italy, to the valley near uh, Maggione where the Rossetti family had lived for centuries. Nona Sofia was torn between longing to move and wanting to keep me under her wing. When I assured her that I would survive on my own, my grandparents sold their condo, relocated to Italy, and I started a new chapter in my life. During the following years, I completed university and went on to a career in graphic design and advertising. Those few years of designing posters for school play plays had left me yearning for approval and acceptance, so I joined a Vancouver company called Vision Quest Advertising. I worked downtown in a cozy office on the fifth floor in the design and graphics department. My specialty was creating logos and unique ca and ad campaigns. I was unmarried, unmotivated, and unhappy. My life revolved around designing other people's dreams and fighting off the occasional glimpse of a predatory gray wolf. It was strange how that wolf seemed to follow me everywhere I went. When my grandparents had packed up my belongings from the house in Bamfield, the boxes had been stowed away in a rental storage unit. There was no room in the condo. Years later, those same boxes were stored in the basement of the small house I was renting in Vancouver. The three gifts that Chief Spencer had given me were safely placed in a shoebox in the back of my bedroom closet. Sometimes I heard them calling me in the dark, lonely night. I struggled to come to terms with my feelings toward my father, but the more I thought of him and his role in my mother's death, the more unforgiving I became. I blamed him for leaving me. It was his fault that I couldn't get close to anyone or commit to a relationship. Why should I? Everyone I love leaves me in the end. My life was filled with monotony, work, home, work. My co-workers tried on numerous occasions to encourage me to go out with them, but I had no interest in developing any relationships with them outside of the office. After a while, I was able to push Bamfield and my parents from my mind. It was almost as if everything had happened to someone else. There were no constant reminders of my past, so I buried it deep in my subconscious mind. I was an orphan. Close your books.